Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another show of Spotlight. In today's Spotlight, we focus on New Jersey senatorial elections. New Jersey has almost more than 6 million votes, and out of which already 1 million have been casted. New Jersey polls show that Biden is leading and then Cory Booker, the incumbent senator, is leading. New Jersey Senate seat, this particular Senate seat, been held by Democrats for the last 40 years, almost 40 years. So now, from the seat, as a Republican candidate, Rick Mehta is running. Mr. Mehta is a biotech entrepreneur, innovator, and a healthcare policy expert, as well as a licensed attorney and a pharmacist. Mehta owns and runs consulting companies in the area of healthcare and input. His professional experience includes working as a consumer safety officer at ESFDA and teaching as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center and Rutgers University School of Health Professionals. Mehta holds a bachelor degree and a JD degree from Rutgers University, a pharma degree from University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and a joint LLM from Georgetown University Law Center, and a graduate institute of international and development studies in Geneva, Switzerland. We we'll speak to Mehta. Welcome, Mr. Mehta. Good evening, Rick. How are you today? Hey, good evening. I'm doing well, Krishna. Thanks so much for having me. How has been the campaign so far, Rick? That's great. Look, I'm so excited to be the first American of Indian origin to win the nomination for the United States Senate seat here in New Jersey. We're just picking up so much momentum up and down the state. Um, and I got to tell you, it's the best job interview I've had for the last year. So we have about 11 days left until Election Day. Mm -hmm. uh, here in New Jersey, it's all vote by mail. So every day for me is election day. And I'm encouraging everyone, uh, your family and friends that are in New Jersey to make sure they cast their ballots and vote. Be a part of the political process. Be a part of history. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm so excited about all the momentum we've been building here in uh, New Jersey, Krishna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How has been the response to Republican Party? Well, let's put it this way. My mm -hmm. opponent, Cory Booker, last year he missed more than 65% of the votes in the Senate. Okay, mm -hmm. people in New Jersey are ready for authentic leadership. They're ready for someone who's going to roll up their sleeves and get the work done. They're ready for someone who actually wants the job and wants to do the job. So when people hear about my credentials, when people hear about my work history, when people hear about my background, in fact, when people hear that I'm not a career politician, they get excited, they mm -hmm. get interested, they get engaged, and they like me. And I mm -hmm. think that's what I, has been the most humbling, that people mm -hmm. are ready for a change in New Jersey. People are ready for someone who's actually going to represent them and represent their interest. Yesterday, you must have definitely watched the presidential debate. How do you think uh, that has an influence on uh, your outcome? Well, I got to tell you, you know, I think the president did a great job. He was very poised, calm, cool, collected, and looked like a leader. Mm -hmm. um, on the other side, you know, I was very concerned about Joe Biden. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, he would trip over his own words. Um, and even on substantive issues, uh, it was actually very alarming, some of the things he said. I mean, he literally said last night, that uh, if he becomes president, he's going to end the oil industry. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty concerning, given that that's such a big industry. And we've been leaders in innovation and in clean energy, be it oil uh, or any other form of energy, uh, wind, solar, uh, nuclear, etc., all throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Ending an entire industry should alarm everyone uh, up and down uh, the state and mm -hmm. up and down the country. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I was actually very concerned about is Joe Biden's proposal uh, for health care. Uh, he called it the Biden care. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, basically what I heard last night is that Joe Biden himself admitted that Obamacare doesn't work, that the Affordable Care Act is broken. Mm -hmm. Something we've all known for a very long time. Last night, we heard Joe Biden admit it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, as a health professional, as someone who's a health law professor at Georgetown, who, someone who's taken great interest in wanting to fix our broken health care system, uh, this was a good admission. Uh, but, you know, one thing, my opponent, Cory Booker, hasn't admitted that. In fact, he continues to push uh, for what we call Medicare for all, which is going to be devastating for our seniors. 
Uh, it's going to bankrupt us. We're already under so much economic strains and, you know, entering into probably a very big recession um, and hopefully doesn't turn into a depression. And under Joe Biden's plan, that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, he didn't present a plan uh, to help small businesses. He didn't present a plan to get our economy kickstarted so it's self-sufficient versus just government handouts. He didn't present a plan on how families are going to be able to uh, feed their children. So uh, I think his own uh, admissions and omissions speak volumes into his candidacy. Uh, but just in general, his character and demeanor looked very weak um, and concerning. About uh, opening up the economy and coronavirus treatment of yesterday's uh, presidential debate. And then uh, you have visited uh, Belmer's gym, right? Sometime back. One of the most controversial things in uh, New Jersey. Okay. Well, it is, it is my uh, campaign uh, political site. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> okay. Tell us more about uh, what happened and then do you support this uh, slowing down, locking down, and then opening up policies of Mur Murphy? Well, I, let me first start by saying Governor Murphy will go down in New Jersey history as the biggest hypocritical governor we've ever had. One of the reasons I opened up my political headquarters site is because Governor Murphy turned our entire pandemic into a political chess game. Mm -hmm. He continued to pick on our small businesses without any scientific or medical proof that they were actually either accelerating the spread of the virus or would be a site to be concerned about. So he's imposed lockdowns on businesses and other sites uh, that haven't shown to uh, extend or increase the case transmission rates. He hasn't uh, extended lockdowns on places uh, that should have been uh, more closely monitored. In fact, think about this. New Jersey has the highest number of COVID deaths per 100,000 than any other state in the country. Okay, mm -hmm. last night we heard about 220,000 deaths in the United States. Almost more than 10% of that is right here in New Jersey. Think about that. More than 10% of the deaths across the country are in New Jersey. And more than half of those deaths happen in nursing homes and long-term care facilities under Governor Murphy's order. Okay, he ordered veterans and elderly patients to be moved from hospitals into nursing homes without a transition plan. And last week, we heard that he quietly fired his health director, something he should have done a long time ago if he was a good leader. Now, mm -hmm. we've asked them to provide scientific data to say, well, are you, you know, picking on the gyms and the restaurants really slowing down the spread of the virus? And what exactly are the concerns? And he's answered nothing. He's provided no science, no data, no epidemiology. Now, you can't pull the wool over my eyes, because remember, the first thing I said, Krishna, is that I'm not a career politician. Mm -hmm. I'm a scientist. In fact, I ran a health department in D.C., mm -hmm. and I oversaw the inspection enforcement of every single hospital, nursing home, long-term care facility in the entire district, okay? I oversaw an organization of 300 women and men dedicated to inspecting these facilities. I'll tell you, something like this would have never happened under my watch. So to say that you're going to impose lockdowns that's crushing our economy, have turned the state into a single public health issue state, Ignoring the fact that substance abuse and mental health and suicide rates have increased exponentially, ignoring that fact, something that I talked about back in early March when the virus first started and the lockdowns were imposed, I said, listen, you can have lockdowns to flatten the curve under the first 14 days, but if you extend quarantine orders, mandatory quarantine orders and isolation orders, you're going to see a spike in mental health cases. And I said, governor, be careful watch out for this, completely ignored it. And now we are suffering from more public health crisis that could have been avoided. These unintended consequences should have been uh, thought through and mitigated early on. And so I'm more than disappointed in this governor. I'm more than disappointed that these businesses have had to suffer at the hand of a bad leader. And I'm more than disappointed that our unemployment rates are uh, highest I've ever seen them with more than 60% of our business shut down, 30% may never reopen. Our entire uh, independent restaurant industry and small businesses have been completely decimated. And even then, the governor withhold, withheld funding to get them back to good again. And so um, it's been beyond disappointing to see his response uh, to our economy, to our public health crisis. 
Uh, and uh, trust me, when I get to Washington, we're going to be holding the governor accountable. Oh, nice of it. Uh, one of the polls in New Jersey, Stockton poll, says that the primary issues for New Jersey voters uh, have been economy, the second most important thing being coronavirus, and third most important thing being uh, healthcare. And in yesterday's uh, president remark saying that we are learning about corona, that is one of the statements. Do you sincerely agree with that statement? Nobody knows anything. China did not share anything, how it has treated. But we are learning every day. In fact, I uh, sarcastically keep putting it as Corona is learning statistics. Okay, okay. So tell us about how the president handled and how best he could have handled, in your opinion, uh, Rick. Yeah, well, look, these are uncharted uh, waters. I mean, the president did the right thing by shutting down travel from China uh, very early back in January, uh, late December, early January. He did the right thing. He had to suffer so many criticisms, even by his opponent, Joe Biden and Cory Booker, who called him a xenophobe and racist for doing that. He probably saved millions of lives and slowed the transmission. This virus hasn't just affected the United States. It's affected the entire world and China is accountable. We are learning more about this virus every day. We didn't know much about it. And our, we have some of the best and the brightest scientists and researchers that continue to advance our thinking and our understanding of this virus. We have reacted to the times and put in plans in place that curb the spread of the virus. I think that's very important. Under Joe Biden, we wouldn't have had a plan. In fact, you saw his response under the Obama administration, under the Obama Biden administration, uh, we, would, we had a much worse response with H1N1. We mm -hmm. know that we have more cases now because we have some of the best testing in the world. You can't use epidemiology mm -hmm. as a source of, of saying that something is not doing right. Just because we're testing more doesn't mean there's more of a problem. Mm -hmm. it's, in fact, it's the opposite. And I'd encourage other countries to increase their testing. If we did, they probably have more cases. So, so to flat out say, well, the United States has more cases than under other countries, it's because we're doing better and more advanced testing. That's step one. But what we really need to be talking about is what is our plan to get back to good? Because that is what's on top of everyone's mind. It's all interrelated. We want a strong economy. We have to end COVID. And you heard last night, the president say Operation Warp Speed is working tremendously. In fact, mm -hmm. yesterday, the FDA, during the day, had an advisory committee meeting for their vaccine advisory group, okay? There we heard debate and discussion about what an emergency use authorization would be. And we heard the president say that distribution of vaccines is gonna be handled through the military. Now we know America has one of the finest militaries, so I have no concern. In fact, I've been fortunate to set up tent hospitals in other countries with the US military uh, to help countries like Haiti when they were in a time of crisis. So I know uh, and trust that our military will do exactly what our commander in chief said they would do last night. The real question is, are we going to get to a safe and effective vaccine? And before we do, are there mitigation steps we can put into place to get our economy kickstarted? And the answer to that is yes, we need to get a stimulus deal, deal done. Now you saw my opponent, Cory Booker, standing on the steps uh, in Washington, basically blocking a vote for the confirmation of a, a Supreme Court justice. These are the kind of theatrics, if he put even 10% of his theatrics into the things that matter to New Jersey, like ending COVID and getting a stimulus bill done, reaching across the aisle and shaking hands with his counterparts and the Republicans to say, guys and girls, let's get this done. You know, let's lock President Trump, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, uh, let's lock them in a room together and, and throw the key away until they walk out with the deal. That's what, the kind of leadership that we need. That's the kind of leadership you don't see from Cory Booker. So step one, we have to end COVID. But before we do, we need to make rapid testing available to everyone. Okay, We need to make sure that businesses feel comfortable so that they can uh, bring in customers and that patrons feel customer visiting businesses. So the only way we're going to save our small businesses until a vaccine is available, distributed, and herd immunity has been achieved. Step two, we have to get a stimulus deal done. Okay, they should have never broke for recess until it was done. You saw the first CARES Act 
that was passed left out four out of the 21 counties in New Jersey receiving zero dollars of stimulus money. That was under Cory Booker's watch. OK, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. holds himself out to be the next secretary of HUD. And he got the entire formula wrong that affected four out of the 21 counties. OK, that's devastating. That's close to one fifth of the counties in New Jersey. Now, they had more Corona cases, coronavirus cases than many of the states that received millions of dollars. That means Cory Booker doesn't have the interest of New Jerseyans at hand. And step three, and this is critical, we have to make sure that we stockpile protective equipment in the case of a second wave, which I'm not convinced yet that may or may not happen, but neither here nor there, we have to be prepared. Now look what's happened. When coronavirus first broke out, okay, we then learned that our medical manufacturing plant, something I've known for years, in fact, it was the cornerstone of my Senate platform before the coronavirus hit, was only elevated and brought to light that our foreign reliance, in particular to China, our reliance on medical manufacturing to China was unprecedented and alarming. Okay, 80% of our active pharmaceutical ingredients, especially for essential medicines, are the building blocks come from China. If China wanted to pull the plug on our supply chain, they could do it. We have to be self-reliant and repatriate our country with our medical supply chain. More than double of those manufacturing jobs opened under the Obama-Biden administration. You know why I know this? Because I worked at the FDA during that time and I literally saw with my eyes the globalization of our supply chain. In fact, I was sent to China on a couple occasions as part of a bigger delegation to discuss supply chain security, of which I could tell you when I was there, the Chinese did not understand it. You can't trust China. You got to bring our medical manufacturing home. Protective equipment and therapeutics need to be manufactured here or in conjunction and partnership with countries that have our democracy and our interests at the top of their minds. End COVID, make rapid testing available, pass the stimulus bill to save our small businesses and bring back our medical manufacturing jobs back to New Jersey. That's my platform and that's what makes me different than Cory Booker. Day before yesterday, Obama was speaking in Pennsylvania and then uh, he told that he, he had kept one playbook for this kind of pandemics ready and they don't know where what happened to the playbook. Is it fair on his part to tell that there is a playbook I have written and then kept it ready my administration? Can you please refer it? You should have done in the March when the corona pandemic is there. Why he, first in the first place, he shouldn't be coming for a campaign. In the second place, he shouldn't say after seven months, oh, I had a play, play, playbook for this kind of pandemics. Did you see? Why did you not see? Do you support that kind of argument? Can you repeat the first part? You said it was as Joe. Yeah, Biden. Obama told that there is a playbook prepared by his administration to handle pandemics because of his H1N1 experience. And then he was questioning yesterday Trump's administration, day before yesterday, seven months after uh, virus came, I'm sorry, the uh, pandemic came into existence. Oh, there was a playbook, we have kept it ready. Oh, why you didn't refer? So that was a question that he put to Trump administration. Is it fair on his part to say so? Why he didn't tell in March? Look, let me, let me share a personal story for you and tell you uh, and answer this question. In 2014 and 2015, I was a senior deputy director of the Health Regulation and Licensing Administration responsible for the oversight and inspection and enforcement of every hospital, health facility, long-term care facility, nursing home, pharmacy, food facility, you name it, anything regulated by the health department fell under my watch. You know the, what that meant? That meant that at the time, uh, we were undergoing uh, preparation for what could have been, but was avoided, um, an Ebola outbreak. Now, Ebola is a very contagious uh, viral disease, a lot more, uh, has a lot more potency um, for causing death than uh, coronavirus does significantly. It's a very, very bad disease, okay? We planned for that, we prepared. I was responsible for preparing every hospital to assure that they had proper procedures and a stock, stock supply of equipment to protect against any potential cases of Ebola that would present to their emergency room. I was never given a playbook. Now I was the senior deputy director um, and the health director and the executive director of the Board of Medicine for DC, okay, the DC Department of Health. I was never provided a playbook by the Obama administration. You would think 
that on the case or the verge of a potential preparing against a potential Ebola outbreak that has 80% death rates, case fatality rates, that if there was a playbook prepared, I would have been given that. That never happened. Uh, do you believe that president said that uh, his uh, vaccination is going to be weeks away or uh, within this year while um, Biden, uh, he smiles sarcastically in yesterday's campaign? Uh, would it have been possible to get the vaccination faster in democratic administration? Well, look, this is an unprecedented virus. And I think these scientists are working day and night to advance our research. I mean, we're fortunate to have some of the best and the brightest um, and the more, most advanced companies with the most advanced technologies. Uh, so two things on that. This is why it's so important that we protect and preserve our medical innovation system, something I've been talking about where my opponent has actually sponsored bills that would crush our medical innovation system right here in uh, New Jersey and right here in America. We don't know enough about the virus yet, but these researchers are learning, okay? I think we heard from the president last night that we're very close to a vaccine that has the potential to work uh, in, in patients. So we have to stay tuned in terms of what the safety and efficacy, but I, I can tell you that the FDA is very strict and stringent in their standards and that when they put their stamp of approval or authorizing the emergency use of a vaccine, I'm gonna trust that it is going to be uh, safe and effective and it's going to help to curb the uh, incident rates of meaning the number of new cases of this virus and stop the spread. It's gonna happen over time. See, what, what the Democrats are doing, and you, you, did, you heard this from Joe Biden last night, and you saw mm -hmm. it on his facial expressions. You heard it from Kamala Harris during her debate. They're casting doubt and shaking public confidence that a, that a vaccine approved under the Trump administration would be safe and effective. That is wrong, and it's despicable that they're playing politics with the pandemic. In fact, you should have strong leaders like Cory Booker stand up and say, you know, as an independent legislative body, I denounce these kind of rhetoric that's undermining public confidence in what could be potential therapeutics and cures to stop and, and save our country from this virus. They don't have a plan. And so what they do is they fear monger. You see that mm -hmm. with Governor Murphy here too. Fear mongering seems to be the key technique that Democrats are pushing to scare people into voting for them. It's wrong and it's immoral. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really hope that they start to change their tune on this. As someone who worked at the FDA, I can assure you that the men and women that are there studying this, working with the scientists, working with the researcher, reviewing the data, won't be able to sleep at, at night unless they know that they've rubber stamped something that they feel the most comfortable with for the American people. And it's wrong to criticize our government employees and those that are working so tirelessly to save our country. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more thing, uh, I, a contradicting thing that I always listen uh, from Democrats, including Obama, I think he tweeted sometime back or during Corona. I think we lost uh, 23 million jobs and then we gained uh, so much, but still uh, we are at the lost sight of 12 million jobs. Okay. And they cry about loss of 12 million jobs, while they also cry for uh, President Trump opening up the economy. And these guys want to shut down the economy. The president want to open the economy. And then the president want to bring up the job numbers more. And these guys at the same time cry about the job numbers or job numbers are going up. So how do you say this uh, a dual uh, thing of uh, Democrats? Hypocrisy. That, that's the only word that you can use to uh, explain it. We cannot be a single public health issue country or a single public health issue state, okay? What we need, well, uh, let, me, let me explain it this way. We don't need just public health policy. We need healthy public policy. Mm -hmm. One that focuses on the totality of the circumstance, one that focuses on the economy because the economy is one of the number one determinants for good public health outcome. And what good is creating lockdowns and saving people from catching the virus of which we know has a very low case fatality rate when people are then increasing in their mental health issues and suicide rates? You know, th this is the problem 
uh, with the Democrats approach. It's always a one size fits all. And it's always a say as I say, do not what I say as I say, not what I do. This oh. is the problem with the Democrats. And what I am having a hard time with is understanding what exactly is their plan to kickstart the economy, get people back to work and start to focus on allowing people to live the American dream. You know, when people have put in uh, years and years of work and, and service into building their business and when 30% may never reopen in the state of New Jersey, are you satisfied uh, yesterday with Hunter Biden's uh, uh, involvement in the things and Joe Biden's reply, who he has been avoiding for almost last five, four or five days? Where is Hunter? You know, why? where is he hiding? Uh, uh, look, this yeah. wasn't... A, go ahead, go ahead. If this wasn't an issue, and, and I do wish that the moderator brought this question up more last night, uh, but it's almost like there's a concerted effort by the media to uh, ignore Hunter and the laptop. I mean, uh, what we understand and what I've read in the press is that there is a lot of um, bad dealings and um, shady things on the laptop. And I think the public deserves to know. But more importantly, the public deserves to know what Joe Biden's involvement with was with all of this. Did he actually use his seat as vice president to induce payments from foreign governments? Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be uh, a very, very bad thing. Um, and uh, I think the public deserves to know that. Uh, I think there's a concerted effort by the media to hide this. Um, and I, I do hope that the FBI works swiftly into uncovering whatever is on that laptop. Mm -hmm. This, uh, when uh, Trump raised the issue of Hunter Biden yesterday, um, Biden uh, ended that conversation or he wanted to put, put a will stop to that conversation saying that it's not your family or my family. We have to work for American families. How do you take the sentence? Does he do agree that, okay, Hunter Biden and him have done something or uh, leave it now, uh, don't bother me kind of a thing? It's a typical, typical um, politician response, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm glad the president called them out on this. He didn't answer the question. He didn't answer the question. He said, leave it for now. This kind of thing that I understood from his smile, kind of a crooked smile, and then whatever he said. That's it. He doesn't want to answer the question. He knows that there's something wrong. And he tried to deflect. And he tried to change the subject and focus on, on America and change the conversation to face the camera. Mm -hmm. President Trump called him out rightfully, say, just answer the question. Why can't you answer the question? So... A uh, typical political answer uh, from a politician that's been there for 47 years um, and where you see that President Trump has done more in 47 months than Biden's 47 years. Why now all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, former Vice President Biden thinks he can fix all the problems with America? And when given the chance and he was vice president, he should have, could have, but he didn't. Uh, let's come back to our New Jersey. I think as on yesterday, there were one million votes polled. And then uh, the survey, a few surveys says that in uh, Southern Jersey, uh, the Trump and then uh, you are more favorable. And in Northern Jersey, uh, Cory Booker is, uh, and then Biden are uh, leading. Biden is leading almost by uh, 20 points in uh, New Jersey, whole New Jersey. And then as per that poll, you, uh, your opponent is leading by 25 points. So tell us something about that. How many votes you think that were polled uh, by Republicans and then all the Republicans voted, I'm sorry, Democrats have polled more votes and all the Democratic votes, did they go to Biden? So tell more about uh, your observation about the voting pattern in New Jersey, Rick. We know that these polls are fake. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's some polls out there that show me up by four points against uh, Cory Booker. You know mm -hmm. why they're fake? Look at the methodology. I'm a mm -hmm. scientist. That's the first thing I turn to. One of the polls polled 500 people, 300 Democrats, 200 Republicans, and 100 independents. You know what that poll found? You mentioned that they had me down by 25 points. What they don't tell you is that over 20% of the people uh -huh. unaffiliated decided not to weigh in at which way they were voting. Uh -huh. 20, 20%, okay? So when you do the math, they had Cory Booker at 52, they had me at 38. Mm -hmm. 
there is a lot of enthusiasm this time among the voters like uh, nationally there are almost 40 million votes have been 45 million votes have been polled by yesterday uh, i think yeah yesterday uh, while uh, the same time in 2016 only 6 million almost seven and a half times more votes polled what is the indication of that enthusiasm well i think people are very look this is one of the most important election years we've ever had You know, I think people are concerned about COVID and but more concerned about what the economy is going to be. They see that a lot of state governors have overreached their authorities. They're very upset about high prescription drug prices that happened under the Obama Biden administration that my opponent Cory Booker did nothing about. They're concerned about access to health care. You know, they they champion and call it the Affordable Care Act. There's nothing affordable about it. I think people want to know what the next four years are going to hold. you know they're nervous about the rhetoric they hear about defunding the police you know and people want to get back to normal they want moderation they want to know that they can have safe and strong communities and that are secure for their children you know i know this because i'm a father too i got three boys and i want to make sure that they grow up here in new jersey in safe communities and i can't um guarantee that under the democrats plan they have look under the biden plan the new jersey tax uh, bracket will be close to 60%. now we're already the highest tax state and we are the number one donor state to washington. that means we get less than 70 cents back to every dollar we spend to dc. what happens to our money and why can't that money be used to support our programs and our people right here in new jersey. when you talk about these counties Warren County, Sussex County, Salem County. Do you know some of these farms don't even have internet access? Now yeah. you have all these kids at home learning from home because of this virus that don't even have access to internet. Internet, basic fundamental things like internet in our country in what should be uh, a very developed state. You know, and so the reason is because we haven't focused on a national infrastructure bill We haven't reached across the aisle to work with the president, Republicans and Democrats alike to say we have crumbling roads, broken airports. We have a gateway tunnel that's been sitting there that's crumbling since the last uh, the superstorm in Hurricane Sandy that we need to come together to work on the things that matter to New Jersey's to get our economy kickstarted. And look, New Jersey and New York is a driver of our economy for the entire country. we need to get those federal dollars back here my opponent has worked to get billions of dollars but what he forgets to tell you is that he sent he's responsible for multi billion dollars leaving leaving new jersey not just what he gets back so it's easy to say well here washington i'm giving you this dollar and then tell people look i've got you 70 cents at 70 cents more than you had it doesn't work and it's broken This is why we need authentic leadership. This is why people are excited about my campaign and my candidacy. This is why the people of New Jersey are begging so desperately for change where they otherwise feel hopeless in a state that has the highest out migration than any other state in the entire country. Okay? Before the pandemic, more than 44% of people wanted to move out of New Jersey. Now it's closer to 69%. because there's no incentives for people to stay here, raise a family or start a business. We have become the most anti-business, anti-family state in the entire country. That will change this year when I win this election. Most of our viewers are uh, interested in knowing about uh, your policy towards uh, immigration. You can explain with reference to if Democrats win what they would do and if you win what you are planning to do. especially for the aspirants of green cards and then the new rules that have been coming every day for the H1 visas please immigration in our country is a broken system whether illegal or legal it's broken the first thing we need to do is we need to secure our border that's a commitment that the president made we've seen remarkable progress in that area and we've seen a decrease in the want of illegal immigration significantly building a wall is not just about curbing illegal immigration it's also about fixing and reducing our narcotic trafficking something of which our country continues to suffer with high opioid abuse i know i've seen it a lot of narcotics come through our borders through our porous borders 
the wall is important, we need to secure our borders. We got to make sure that other countries aren't creating incentive programs for their people to try to uh, enter our country illegally. The premise of our immigration system and our visa system was to create incentives. It was to recruit the best and the brightest, like my father, who came here with only $100 in his pocket 50 years ago. Okay, we didn't have much when we came here, but we came here to live the American dream. That's why we have such deep appreciation for the country that's given us so much. That's why I can stand here before you as the first American of Indian origin to win the United States Senate seat for either Democrats or Republicans in the state of New Jersey, a state that has the second largest population of Indian Americans in the entire country. I'm a testament of that. I'm a reflection of you and many others that have put in so much sacrifice and hard work and risk to immigrate here. As it relates to the green cards, look, we're in a crisis. We have government inefficiency left and right. We have one of the worst paperwork problems this country has ever seen. In an age of technology, the fact that paperwork is the rate limiting step for advancing innovation is a disaster. In the throes of a pandemic, we have over 20,000 physicians and nurses that are in a visa backlog, a log jam, I should say of which many of their children are aging out of the protections they have under their parents that are legal immigrants. We gotta work on an immigration system that works for all. We gotta put America first. We gotta make sure we protect American workers and make sure that our visa system is built to create innovation and opportunity for everyone as it is intended to do. At the end of the day, America is a cultural melting pot and we've assimilated from re re religions, creeds, uh, cultures from all across the country. We need to make sure we preserve that. Uh, but what we don't need is a rhetoric we keep hearing from the Democrats. In fact, very xenophobic rhetoric from, from Senator Dick Durbin and, and many others um, who are anti-Indian, um, anti-Brown, and they don't want um, to uh, either lift caps or even talk about ways in which we can fix this backlog. The Republicans have led the charge and we will continue to lead the charge. And when I get to Washington, we will work on fixing our broken immigration system. What is your plan? Like, see, once upon a time, I heard you saying that Cory Booker never came uh, uh, beyond 286, south of 286, right? That's what's your statement. South okay. Of South yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what is your plan for the people uh, towards not of the same road? Like how your campaign is addressing the issues around the people in North New Jersey? We're actually going and talking to people in those okay. communities. I've spent probably a bulk of my campaigning down in South Jersey. In fact, one of the other reasons why I opened my campaign uh, political site down at the Attilas Gym in Belmar, it's because it's time that we had a U.S. senator that represents the entire state, not just North Jersey or north of Route 78. Mm -hmm. Cory Booker is nowhere to be found. Okay. In fact, I went to go visit his uh, office in Newark, and even the, uh, even the um, security guard said that he, she hasn't seen him um, and uh, doesn't know where he is and hasn't shown up in months. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't show up to work, okay? never, never mind uh, visiting places. But when you hear from these people, they want legislators that can address their issues, issues like the opioid crisis, Issues like um, making more local, giving more local control over um, effectuating opportunity zones, which is a great program that President Trump has uh, put forward. Uh, making sure that uh, more funding comes to uh, helping children achieve educational and academic success, rather than some of the indoctrination policies we've pushed, we've seen pushed by the governor. They want to make sure that they can create more jobs, help their tourism industry it's getting crushed even before COVID. They wanna make sure that they can keep some of their tax money and get more federal funding back to creating more programs and stimulating growth and economic opportunity for all. If we had a Senator that actually listened, these things could have, been get, could have gotten done. And that's exactly what I'm bringing to the table. A Senator that represents the entire state, not just North Jersey. Mm -hmm. One of the most pressing issue is that Democrats are trying to own uh, most of the Indians uh, and then who are the voters, stating that the Republican Party is a racist party. And then more or less they try, they, they succeeded, hopefully they succeeded until now. 
And then yesterday the topic came, the moderator asked about the racism and then Trump was telling, uh, okay, I'm the least racist, I'm sorry, racist person in the entire crowd. So do you believe that Republicans are least racist and why should uh, Biden be believed that he is not racist? Please explain to our uh, audience and viewers. Well, first of all, let's let me talk about it at a personal level. OK, uh, growing up, I've experienced and understand and been in the throes of racism. And I can assure you right now that is not the way that I want my children to have to grow up. I mean, Dr. Martin Luther King said it best is that uh, judge him not by the color of his skin, by, but by the, uh, his character and his integrity. That's what he wanted for his children, for our children. That was the American dream that he talked about. What we need to do is focus on the policies. What policies are helping to advance the communities that have been marginalized for so long? Marginalized by politicians like Joe Biden, okay? Let's talk about a couple of them. First of all, let's talk about economics, because for there to be um, to close the gap in disparity in wealth, you need to create economic opportunities for the black community. That's exactly what President Trump has done. We saw the lowest unemployment rates among black America than we've ever seen, historically lowest than any other president, significantly lower than even President Obama was able to do or cared to do. Remember, Joe Biden was vice president. Mm -hmm. Then President Trump took it a step further and got criminal justice reform done. OK, now my opponent, Cory Booker, continues to plug that as his monumental achievement. But the truth is he, he had to get it done and he could only get it done when President Trump was president. Not before. Why didn't he get it done when President Obama was president? He was still senator. They couldn't get it done. They had control of the Senate. They had control over the House. They had control over the presidency. And they still didn't pass criminal justice reform. So put aside the words, put aside the rhetoric, put aside the tweets, focus on the policy, focus on the pocketbooks. Who's actually doing what they say and getting things done for the community? Every year, historically black colleges, one that I'm very fond of, Howard University and so many others, would have to come year over year begging for funding and money. Every year they would have to ask for more money. Why? President Trump got rid of that. Mm -hmm. He said, you know what? I don't understand why we have to write you a check every year. Let's just make it for 10 years mm -hmm. so you can live in confidence and grow your academic uh, institutions. Ones that have such uh, strong history and culture in our community ones that have made us proud of being Americans. They shouldn't have to beg for that. President Trump did that. All you hear are vapid talking points by Joe Biden. 47 years he's been in Washington and has done not even 10% of the things that President Trump has accomplished in 47 months. You can talk about whatever words are being used. And let me tell you, Joe Biden is not innocent in here. And I, this is something I'll never forget. He was doing an interview with Charlemagne the God. And Joe Biden went on record to say, well, you ain't black unless you know who you're voting for. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Who is Joe Biden to tell us what kind of ethnicity, uh, race, or color are we based on political affiliation? Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, I'm a proud Republican and a proud person of color. And Joe Biden does not represent me. And this mm -hmm. isn't the first gaffe he's had in uh, controversial uh, racial comments. And you know what? I asked Cory Booker to denounce it. Mm -hmm. Just like he's tried to denounce President Trump, just like he continues to try to slap down uh, our future Supreme Court Justice Judge Barrett, just like when it doesn't favor his political ideology or wins, he plays the race card. Mm -hmm. But you know what? To this day, Cory Booker has not denounced Joe Biden. Not only that comment, he also made comments when comparing uh, blacks with Hispanics and then Indians and banking donors. So various things are there for uh, Joe Biden.
Well, I think uh, the most offensive one is uh, even to talk about the fact that he equates uh, low income with black. He'll say mm -hmm. white kids and uh, and uh, low income black kids. Yes. So, you know, he himself has self-identified that in 47 years, he suppressed the black community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the last segment, how much voting will happen in New Jersey of the 6 million plus voters this time? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's hard to predict this year is unprecedented and uncharted waters. We're having mm -hmm. the first completely universal vote mm -hmm. by mail election, mm -hmm. which I still maintain is an unconstitutional overreach by the governor. Um, again, he changed the process and moved the goalpost at the last minute, uh, it potentially disenfranchising many voters. But, you know, we've been out there encouraging people to vote uh, and get out the vote. Everyone should have received a ballot at their house um, and uh, encourage people. It's three easy steps to fill it out and mail it in. Or uh, what I've been telling people is to drop it off at, in their secure drop box. Look, if you live in a county, go to the county website, the Board of Elections or the county clerks, or go to my website, rickforenj.com. That's R-I-K-F-O-R-N-J.com. We have uh, vote by mail um, and a secure drop box locations on our website and drop it off. You know, everybody should be involved in the political process. Um, many, uh, uh, Americans of Indian origin, Indian Americans I speak to always feel underrepresented. Uh, and then I ask them, have you voted? And they say, no, you know, what good is uh, voting or I don't want to get involved or th they don't put importance into it. I can't begin to tell you that voting is more important than getting your driver's license. Voting is more important than any other government form you've ever filled out in your life. It's your ability to be involved in the political process, your ability to influence influence the outcome of an election. Uh, and this year, your ability to put the first American of Indian origin in Washington from the state of New Jersey and to represent the community and to represent the entire state of New Jersey and bringing authentic leadership. So if you don't think your voice matters, you're, you're woefully wrong. Get involved, get out the vote, fill out your ballot and vote for Rick Maida. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then one more thing, and I just close this one after asking this question. I think uh, we have, a, I have a friend uh, who is a green card holder and then a foreign alien uh, with H1 visa. And both of them got with their names to their address ballot papers. How are you equipped to file this one? And are you expecting this result to come on election night? Or you have to wait for more time than election night? Yeah, Rick. good question. So if you get um, a ballot that's not meant to be given to you, I mean, we've heard a lot of cases of people getting ballots for people either who moved away or passed away. Mm -hmm. um, that's bad. You know, I, I encourage people to call the county clerk's office and the board of elections and talk to them. They're the ones that are uh, administering this process um, and would be the best equipped to handle uh, any issues or questions or complaints about the balloting and the vote by mail process. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, e equipped, I mean, I think that's really the best thing that uh, people could do. Mm -hmm. Okay, then thank you, Rick. Thanks for your time. And I wish you all the good luck and hope uh, we will see you after November 3rd as a senator. Yeah. Thank well, you. First, well, thank you. And uh, the last comment I'm going to make is that, it, you know, after the primary, we did see that it took more than 60 days to certify the results. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm hoping that the governor has put in a plan, but what I hear from our county clerks, there really isn't any good strong plans to count ballots. Um, it's likely, as I mentioned, every day is election day and election day won't end on November 3rd. So, you know, it's likely that we may not have certified results for weeks until after November 3rd, but everyone should be watching. Everyone should be stayed in. Until then, we have 11 days. I encourage everyone get involved. Either donate your time or donate your money uh, but either way, donate and get involved. We have a historical event. Uh, be a part of it uh, and go to my website, rickforenj.com and uh, reach out and get involved. So th thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Rick. Viewers, that's Rick Mehta, the Republican contender for Senate seat from New Jersey. I wish him all the good luck. Thank you.